Thank you. Rabbits became a, a serious environmental and agricultural pest in Australia almost as soon as they started spreading from their point of introduction in the 1850s. Um, and they remained more or less unmanageable for 100 years until myxomatosis was introduced in the 1950s. Um, some places there weren't sufficient uh, flying insect, biting insect vectors to spread myxo around in the first instance and uh, myxo didn't become effective in those areas until the European rabbit flea was introduced in the 1970s. Um, however, myxomatosis on, on its own wasn't enough to control rabbit damage in agricultural areas uh, until uh, the development of 1080 poison baiting techniques and warren ripping were widely applied in the 1970s and 80s in programs that were delivered largely through local government boards. Um, rabbits still remain problematic in areas where access was denied due to terrain or vegetation in conservation reserves and in the arid interior where myxomatosis uh, wasn't effective because there were few biting insect vectors. So to try and overcome that problem in the arid zone uh, in the early 1990s, uh, a second arid adapted flea species was introduced from Spain. And uh, while Brian Cook was uh, in Spain studying those fleas, a new disease emerged in rabbits and swept through Europe, uh, causing devastation in their wild populations within their native range, and that was rabbit hemorrhagic disease. Um, it was uh, identified that the causative agent was a Khaleesi virus that was specific to rabbits, and so its potential as a biological control uh, in Australia was immediately apparent. Um, it was introduced into Australia and within 12 months of its uh, uh, accidental escape from Wardang Island, it had reached most rabbit populations in Australia and uh, there have been naturally recurring uh, outbreaks of the disease in almost every rabbit population in Australia since that time. Its impact was highest in the arid inland areas where rabbits were formerly uncontrolled and responsible for a lot of the uh, total grazing pressure. In the high rainfall areas, uh, it had a lesser and much more variable impact. And we now know that that was due in large part to the presence in those areas of a, a pre-existing non-pathogenic Khaleesi virus, which provided some degree of antibody cross protection against disease from RHD. Um, the latest estimates of economic benefit for uh, the introduction of RHD suggests it's been somewhere in the order of $350 million per year uh, since its introduction, but the estimates also say we, we've still got about $200 million of agricultural damage attributable, attributable to rabbits every year. Uh, to add to those uh, residual problems, uh, rabbit numbers are increasing again uh, as uh, resistance to disease is developing in rabbits. Um, the uh, recovery became apparent in most areas beginning in about 2003, uh, although in recent years it's uh, declined a little and it's still unclear uh, where it will eventually uh, settle out. One of the uh, concerning issues is that uh, the increase was apparently much more rapid in areas where widespread fox baiting uh, programs had been conducted and that actually led to the cessation of the fox baiting program in Hattakalkine because of the dramatic increase in rabbit numbers. Um, and it's perhaps a salutary warning that uh, fox control without associated rabbit control can create as many problems as it solves. Nevertheless, uh, the introduction of RHD did create a great opportunity for long-term rabbit control. It's always been a, a standard for rabbit control that it works best when other uh, naturally occurring situations have reduced rabbit populations uh, or their reproductive capacity. Hit them when they're down. Um, and in those areas where uh, widespread ripping programs were enacted after the immediate spread of RHD, um, rabbit numbers have been heavily suppressed uh, for extended periods. And some great examples here from the Victorian Rabbit Buster Program where the government there invested $10 million in, in rabbit ripping programs uh, after RHD. Oh, I should say that there may 
again, be opportunities for this sort of work to go ahead with new RHD strains that are around at the moment. Uh, the effect of rabbits on uh, preventing regeneration of perennial vegetation is well recognised through uh, taking out the uh, seedlings of, of young shrubs and trees. Uh, in our study site in the Flinders Ranges, before RHD, we were recording shrub recruitment only in those areas where we'd done widespread uh, warren ripping programs, despite the increase in kangaroo grazing and, and sheep grazing in those areas where we did the con rabbit control. After RHD, in those same areas, we were getting roughly equal levels of uh, recruitment in both ripped and unripped areas. Now, recruitment of a few straggly acacias in the Flinders Ranges may not seem very important, um, but if this level of recruitment was repeated across only 1% of the rabbit infested areas in the arid zone, it would amount to 100 million shrubs per year and could easily outweigh all of the other vegetation programs that have been conducted in Australia. There was also a, a short-lived uh, recruitment pulse for some of the more highly palatable shrubs like bullet bush and an Eremophila alternifolia. Um, however, rabbits soon put a stop to that when they recovered slightly and now we see that uh, all of the young shrubs which didn't grow tall enough to escape rabbit grazing before that recovery began have been either killed or been reduced to rabbit bonsai like this example. Uh, there are other examples of recruitment pulses and, and recovery in uh, plants in the higher rainfall areas, including things like the uh, recovery of uh, terrestrial orchids in the Coorong National Park, but there's not sufficient time to detail that here. The, the first official release of uh, RHD in South Australia occurred out at the Turret Field Research Centre near Gawler. And, uh, Ron Sinclair and Dave Peacock and John Kowaliski have since that time maintained a, a very intensive epidemiological monitoring program out there um, which has provided this fantastic picture of how the disease is affecting uh, rabbit populations and that's led to some, some really uh, interesting uh, scientific collaborations and interest from local, uh, international and uh, 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 interstate uh, collaborators, including some here with Damien Fordham's group at the university. We've also been very interested in, in what the virus itself is doing, uh, and we've done that by looking at the uh, genetic makeup of viruses which are extracted from the liver of rabbits which have recently died of RHD. Now, this genetic tree, the details are not important at all. Um, the critical factors that we've been able to show is that this tree shows the degree of genetic relatedness of different viruses. And since RHD was first released, uh, there's been genetic divergence. The viruses have been changing at a steady and continuous rate. And the newer emerging uh, variants have been replacing the older ones so that they drop out of the system. Uh, more critically, perhaps, is that Despite the uh, divergence of the virus here in Australia, um, none of the RHDVA or RHDV2 type strains have become apparent in Australia until the last year or so. Uh, and they are ones which had become uh, predominant in Europe and elsewhere in the world. Um, so a major research program was gonna be begun about five years ago by the Invasive Animals CRC. Um, to look at whether any of these new viruses might be useful in uh, overcoming genetic resistance or antibody cross-protection. Uh, five viruses uh, were tested in detail and one of these, a Korean strain, um, showed up as uh, being selected uh, on, its, on the basis of its uh, better performance. And uh, there is now a uh, proposed release for this virus later in the year. Uh, landholder groups can still nominate um, to be part of a, a wide-scale release if they choose to do so. However, the proposed release is now likely to be delayed because of this beast. RHDV2 uh, is a completely new virus which first turned up in France in 2010 and very rapidly spread through Europe and replaced all of the older strains. 
One of its critical characteristics is that it can infect rabbits which are immune to other strains of RHDV and that's aided its spread immensely. In May last year, it turned up unannounced in Canberra. Uh, by October, it had gone 500 kilometres in every direction. It got to South Australia in December. It's now present at a lot of sites in South Australia, mostly detected in domestic rabbits, but we've also heard many reports of declining wild rabbit populations, and we have a series of samples from the southeast yet to confirm its presence there. Um, we suspect that it will be prevalent in most South Australian rabbit populations uh, by within 12 months of now, and that it will cause significant declines. Whether RHDV2 and the Korean K5 strain between them cause a blip in the, in the chart or more prolonged suppression remains to be seen. So, um, what do we do about that? Well, the, there's no doubt that the greatest benefit from the spread of these new strains will be found where they're followed up with carefully constructed uh, conventional control programs to take advantage of that and, and provide long-term suppression. Um, they won't control rabbits themselves, but they provide a great opportunity. Uh, also, be careful not to regard them as a silver bullet, um, particularly for people who are interested in um, uh, native plant recruitment. Uh, rabbits can't be ignored at any density. There's mounting evidence that at densities of less than one rabbit per hectare, they cause problems in most plant communities. And at those levels, most people aren't aware of their presence, or many people aren't aware of their presence, and most people regard them as too low levels to be a problem. And finally, uh, if any of you are out doing field work and happen to come across a dead rabbit that hasn't been run over or shot, please throw it in a plastic bag, stick it in the freezer and give us a call because we can only study the virus from field samples collected in that way. Thank you. At the moment, this is an exotic disease. Uh, there is no uh, uh, enactment of uh, a, an exotic disease preparedness program to try and get rid of it, but uh, no, we can't legally spread it anyway. Uh, no, in fact, uh, we did get one sample from the Flinders at that time. Dave Peacock found a, an old carcass that, and we extracted it. It was a field strain. Uh, the spread was slightly prolonged in that instance due to seasonal effects. Um, however, uh, and in fact, the summer rain we've had may have got other instances going where it might just be field strains, but so far, every example we've had submitted that's been had virus in it since December has been RHDV2. Uh, look, they all get spread primarily by flies, we believe, but it can be contact uh, fleas, mosquitoes, um, fox faeces, fox urine, you know, all sorts of things. Okay, thanks very much.